I think we all know the experience uh, from time to time how frustrating it can be when you're in the midst of something and you lose power, right? We've all had that moment. I remember a few years ago, um, it was on April 14th. And, um, and we had like a blackout on my street. I don't know what caused it, where power goes out. And I just hear some guy yell out the window, like, no, like my neighbor, I have to finish my taxes. Like he's in the middle of like taxes were due. Like this is the worst possible timing. As a teenager, I had the opportunity to travel to Albania. I've told stories about that before, but this was shortly after communism had fallen in that country. And so um, when we were there, we were doing various work projects, but the infrastructure of the country was just in shambles. And so you never knew when you were going to have power. Um, sometimes it would be on and be available, and, and if it was, you would try to get as much work done as possible, but, but oftentimes it would cut out unexpectedly and you had no idea when it was gonna return. So every time there was power, we would make sure that the the, the water was being heated, it was an electric water heater so that later we could do dishes or take a shower or whatever. If you were on the work site, you would wait for that moment when there was power and then you would do all the things that had to be done with, with power tools because this was your only opportunity to do it. When, when we run out of gas in the car and it, it coasts to a halt, we know how without power, without fuel that drives it, we don't get very far. We don't get very far on, on our own. I think um, it's always interesting to look at the perspective of Christian history and the Christian faith from, from somebody who is seeing it not necessarily through the lens of their own faith, but looking at it historically. Um, there's a Yale professor of history, a former Yale professor of history, he's passed away since, but his name is Kenneth Scott Latourette. This is what he wrote looking at Christianity. He said, the more one examines various features which seem to account for the extraordinary victory of Christianity, the more one is driven to search for a cause underlying them all. It's clear that at the very beginning of Christianity, there must have occurred a vast release of energy virtually unequaled in history. Without it, the future course of this religion is inexplicable. Why this occurred may lie outside the realm in which modern historians are supposed to move. I think Lazarette's observations here are fascinating. Looking at the history of Christianity from a purely historic perspective, he says the spread of, of the faith, the growth of the church is unexplicable. Particularly when you count for all the sort of social and, and political opposition that the early church was facing. So Lazarette is pondering a question which simply cannot be answered in a purely historical point of view. For this reason, he concludes, this is why, why this occurred may lie outside the realm in which modern historians are supposed to move. The book of Acts is, is also a book of history. It's the history of the early church, the beginning and the spread of of the gospel message as it goes out from this epicenter of the life of Christ. The beginning of that book, and we're going to look at this today, Jesus tells his disciples in chapter 1, verse 8, verse eight you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Later in, in chapter 2, as the disciples are gathered together, it describes them as being filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 17 of the same chapter, again, God says, I will pour out my spirit. What Acts describes for us here in these verses is the event that Lazarus supposes must have taken place. This is the vast release of energy virtually unequaled in history. God is, is in their midst. God is, is at work. The spirit is on the move. This is the cause of underlying them all the very same spirit that is alive and is at work in us to this day we are all a part of of this remarkable story as as the church if you have if you're new with us this morning um, we have been a part of a a series now studying the the person and the presence and the power of the holy spirit and most of our time thus far has been spent looking at the words of Jesus as he is preparing his disciples for this, 
this awaited arrival of the Holy Spirit. We were in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. But however, this morning we're going to jump now to the book of Acts, where the promise that Jesus spoke to those disciples previously is now going to be fulfilled. And the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be on display. This will be our, our focus in our time together this morning. What, what is the power of the Holy Spirit? What, what do we mean when we talk about that? And what is its purpose and, and how do we experience it? Some 2,000 years later than, than these words in this moment in history is, is recorded. That's where we're going to begin today. Let's turn and look at Acts chapter 1 together. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1, and this is just some context here. This is Jesus meeting with his disciples right before he is going to ascend in, into heaven. So it's post-resurrection, and, and right before Pentecost, which we'll get to in a moment, Jesus is meeting with his disciples. These are sort of his last words before he ascends into heaven, beginning in verse 4. It says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now jump over with me to the beginning of chapter 2. These are the first 13 verses here, what's commonly referred to as the experience of Pentecost. Beginning in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Amelites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Capp Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygeria and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. There's a lot there that, that we just covered. And, and before we really start to dig into what's unfolding here, I want to acknowledge that this passage that we just read is, is one of several or many experiences where the Holy Power demonstrate or the Holy Spirit demonstrates his power in the pages of Scripture. This is certainly not at all the, the first example. And we know that it's the Holy Spirit's power at work in us that even enables us to believe in Jesus in the first place. That, that is the power of his work. Pastor Jeff is going to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit next week as he gives us life of regeneration. He's going to talk about the example of, of Nicodemus in John chapter 3, how he tells, tells him you must be born again. We know that it's the Holy Spirit's power that moves us from spiritual death to spiritual life. As that which is spiritually dead, we have no power in and of ourselves. The Holy Spirit accomplishes that. It's the Holy Spirit's power that enables us to live like Jesus. It's, it's his work in us that produces Christ-likeness. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about the, the fruit of the Spirit. It, it's the Holy Spirit's power that calls us and equips us for the work of the church. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about the, the gifts of the Spirit. 
All of these things are, are exhibits, are the demonstration of the Spirit's power. But what strikes me here, as we look at this passage, as we look at Jesus' word in, in chapter 1, is just how overt or, or singularly focused the words of Jesus are to his disciples. He says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So we begin by understanding that the Holy Spirit's power is the power to witness for Jesus. The Holy Spirit's power in our lives is, is the power that he gives us to witness for Jesus. Think about the moments in your life, particularly if you're a sports fan, right? We, we think about some of the greatest sporting events in history. And one of the things, if you run in these circles or whatever, if you are married to or are a sports fan or have sports fan friends, one of the things that we love to do is share the time that we were at some ultimately great game. My wife and I had the opportunity a couple years ago to go to the Ohio State-Michigan game in Columbus when Ohio State came back and won in overtime. And we had this sense the whole time. We were like, we were here. We saw it. We got to be a part of it. The whole place is just so energetic. If you're a Cubs fan, like all along in the World Series, you just heard people either talking about the games that they got to go to or their memories from, from years past. And I even heard people on the radio talking about relatives or somebody that was at the game at Wrigley where Babe Ruth famously pointed out the called shot game. Like we, we love to say, I was there in that moment. I saw it. In, uh, in 2007, when LeBron James was relatively new to the Caval uh, Cleveland Cavaliers and they saw what was unfolding there, Nike created an ad campaign that captured this very thing that ran not only in Cleveland, but around the nation, but was was on huge billboards throughout Cleveland. I brought a picture of it. We are all witnesses. Like we, we are seeing this incredible thing unfold around us. Chicago, it didn't land so well, like, right? We were like, we've seen something better, but, <laughs> but that was the phrase. They were capturing this, this biblical notion here that, that is, resides, we saw it. We were there for it. We perceived it. See, I know in a, in a passage like this, I, my tendency, and maybe you feel this way too, is there's all kinds of incredible things happening. And my tendency can be to want to jump into all of those. What is he talking about when he says you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And, and what is this rushing wind that comes in? And why are people speaking in all of these different languages? And I want to deal with and, and answer those questions. But to do that sometimes, I miss what's so overt and obvious here. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses. You see, the first statement makes the second statement possible. Here in these verses, Jesus, in, in no uncertain terms, is reminding his disciples that they have a job to do. He, he's reminding them that they've been given a responsibility to spread the word about Jesus. Acts chapter 2 records this, this powerful initiation beginning of this work. Th this is the birth of the church here. And the disciples begin to bear witness in, in Jerusalem about Jesus. So what does it mean? What does it mean for us to bear witness? To, to give witness to? Literally, this is describing or calling the, to give testimony, to testify about the truth that you saw. So Jesus then is saying that when, when the Holy Spirit comes in power, he comes that you will speak about what, the, what we saw, what they saw and heard regarding Jesus. They, they'll tell people about his miracles. They're going to tell people about, about what they, he taught them regarding the kingdom of God. They're going to tell people that, that he was crucified on a Roman cross, but that he walked out of that grave. They're, they're going to tell people that Jesus is alive. They're going to they're tell them how he has provided a way for the forgiveness of sins and restored people back into a relationship with their God. They're going to tell them everything that they saw. And this is exactly what we see happen. This is back in, in Acts chapter 2, picking it up. Now, now Peter is beginning to 
this guy who's been so quiet and reserved and dealing with everything that happened is now boldly proclaiming, and he's standing in Jerusalem. This is what he says. This is back in verse 22 now of, of chapter 2. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man tested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. See, Peter begins to bear witness. He begins to share the story of what Jesus has done, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit in him that is enabling him to do so. And it is the same power in us for the very same purpose. See, unlike the first disciples, we are not eyewitnesses of the resurrection. So, so what does the power, is Holy Spirit's empowering of us to bear witness mean? It means that we are empowered, you and I are empowered to, to give account or to share our firsthand knowledge of the risen Christ. To share our firsthand knowledge of the risen Christ. And this is, there's two fundamental elements here. One is, is knowledge of, understanding of the core gospel message. This is exactly what Peter is sharing as he stands in the streets of Jerusalem. And we're going to talk more about this, by the way. We're, we have something coming in January called Explore God, that we are really, really excited about. And it's an initiative for us to be able to invite our community in for that exact purpose, to explore God. And we're going to be preparing over these next several months to come alongside of people and, and ask questions and, and, and listen to their responses and be a part of this process for this purpose. We're going to be trained in understanding the gospel and how, do we, how and when do we speak. But I think the second part of this is so critical because we also have to know and understand our story, our, our account. What is your firsthand knowledge of the risen Christ? So we have to be careful not to fall into the trap that, that tells us that it's sort of the professional's job to tell people about Jesus. That, that's like the pastor's job. It is my job, but it's not my job because I'm a pastor. It's my job because I've been given the power of the Holy Spirit as a follower of Jesus to do so. It's the same reason it's your job. I've been given power to, to bear witness, to tell my story. And if you've trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, so have you. It's that very same power at work in us that we see on display here with the disciples some 2,000 years ago to tell the story. Later, Peter, who, who is training people, who we just heard telling the story of Jesus to these massive crowds in Jerusalem, he's helping to prepare a second generation of Christians, and he writes this to him. He says, but in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. I think Peter is speaking from experience here. Additionally, now we discover that, that the Holy Spirit's power is the power to overcome fear. The power to overcome fear. I uh, asked my wife for permission to t tell you all this, but um, she is horribly afraid of flying. Um, it, it just it, days before she knows she's going to fly, she's a nervous wreck and the day of, and like, I have to be careful, like, what she sees on the news, like, if there's anything about flying anything, I just, you know, turn the channel really quick and get it off of there, and then when we fly, like, if I'm with her, usually, like, her nails are dug, you know, into my leg as we go, and, and any sign of turbulence, like, just the, the, the lady rolling the cart down, you know, to bring us a drink, it's like, you know, what is that? We're going down, you know, and, and she's just is a very, very nervous flyer, and I, every time we're on our way somewhere, I think to myself, she's not, she's not coming back. Like, we're, we're, there's no way she is getting on a plane to get back to this place. And we're, I'm renting a car, and we're driving from Mexico, or we're driving from California, we're driving from wherever we're at. And inevitably, she gets back on that plane. Why? Like, what? See, the destination, what, what lies on the other side of that trip 
for her is greater than the fear that she has of flying. Like, my family's back there. I got to get back. My, my, or on the way there, like, as, as horrified as I am, I know what waits for me there. And I have to get there. See, the Holy Spirit's power in us is a power to overcome fear because we know what lies on the other side. We know what awaits us. If we were to do a quick survey in this room and we were to say, hey, what is it, what is it that prevents us from talking to people about our faith? What is it that ultimately... If, if we're going to share Jesus, ultimately limits our willingness or our ability to do that. In my experience, working with students and working in the church, two things generally emerge. One is we feel like we're under-equipped. So we're just kind of the question of what am I going to say? I'm not sure if I have the right answers, and, and I just don't feel prepared to do this. The second and the far more prominent one is, is, is just fear. It's fear of how someone is going to react, what their response will be. It's fear of awkwardness and, and, and fear that the relationship might get weird. It's all sorts of, of fear. You name it, and fear then ultimately becomes paralyzing. And this has been the case for, our, uh, for the disciples here. Following the crucifixion, they, they have been hiding, literally hiding for their lives. Even following the resurrection, we, we do see them go out and tell people that Jesus is resurrected, but the, the examples that we have in Scripture of that is them going to inform other followers of Jesus that he's conquered the grave. They go back and tell the rest of the dead. They go people who have been tracking with Jesus' ministry and, and tell them that he's alive. We don't see them. There's no recorded example where they're just out on the streets in Jerusalem informing people that Jesus has resurrected. But now here in, in Acts chapter 2, these disciples, these same ones, now share the story. They overcome fear when the Holy Spirit comes on them. If you, if you flip over now to Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, um, as a result of healing a man on the Sabbath, are called to stand in front of the very same governing body that had, that had um, sentenced Jesus to be crucified. So that's, I think, fairly intimidating environment. They're called in front of this because it says earlier in this text that these leaders were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So this is their response now, picking it up in, in verse 8 of chapter 4. He says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from, from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. And this is their, their response. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I love this passage, and I love what unfolds here. I love the fact when they're, they're called in front of this, they're called into this incredibly intimidating moment for healing somebody, for basically proclaiming the gospel, and they're very overt and saying, listen, we don't want you to do this anymore, that their response is to proclaim the gospel. Like, like Peter is just, he says, hey, there's no other name under which you're going to be saved. Let's be clear about what's happened here and who did it and what you need. Like his boldness is, is overwhelming. But then I also love the response of, of the Sadducees in verse 13, that they had recognized that they had been with Jesus. But what sticks out to me about this is that that had been previously true. I mean, the disciples had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus following the crucifixion. When, when, when there was so much fear and so much concern and, and so much limitation in terms of, of who they were talking to. And they had been with Jesus after the resurrection. 
But it's not ultimately till the Holy Spirit arrives in power here in Acts 2, they begin to boldly proclaim Jesus. This is, this is the Holy Spirit's work in them. The fact that they had been with Jesus and that this was working itself out and this bold proclaiming became evident after the Holy Spirit had, had come upon them. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. So I, don't, I don't want you to hear this this morning and, and feel guilt. Like I, This is not like you all, we all need to go out there and do a better job of evangelizing our friends and, and telling people about Jesus. What I want you to feel this morning is what I think the scripture is conveying to us is the power and the courage that the Holy Spirit gives us, the boldness that comes from his activity in our lives. And when people see it, I think it becomes evident to them that we have been with Jesus. Paul later writes, for God gave us, did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Ultimately, then we discover too that the Holy Spirit's power is the power to overcome obstacles. The power to overcome obstacles. Of course, fear can very much be an obstacle, but when we look at this passage, again, it's, it's sort of hard for us not to see or not to focus on all of the extraordinary things that are going on in Acts chapter 2. Because rightly so, it is an amazing display of, of God's power in his work but we can miss his overarching purpose taking place here. Look again real quickly back in Acts 2, verses 4 through 6. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. And then further down, halfway through verse uh, 11, it says, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? See, Pentecost was a, a Jewish holiday that was 50 days after Passover. So it's been about 50 days since the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And, and this was also one of the three pilgrimage festivals of, of the Jewish people. So this means that all these people have gathered in Jerusalem as a part of their, their faith and of their worship of God. There's people that speak all sorts of different languages coming from ev all ends of the earth. This is the, the environment to which Peter and John are going to begin to, and the disciples are going to share the gospel. And what's the obvious roadblock that's in place here? It's, it's understanding. It's their ability to hear their words. And so the Holy Spirit does something incredibly unique here. He enables the, the disciples to be able to proclaim a risen Jesus in the languages of the people that are there to hear it so that they might understand what Jesus has accomplished. If you think about this from a strategic perspective, how incredible that God has gathered all these people from all over the known world at the time that he's empowered his disciples to now proclaim this message in all sorts of different languages so that you talk about the explosion, this vast release of energy of the church. These people are all going home. And they're all going to share the story about what they've heard and what they've seen and what Jesus has done. I think that when we read something like this, for me, I can make one of two mistakes. I can read Acts chapter 2 and I can, I can think about my own experiences and think it's, it's, why, it should be like this. Why isn't it more like this? Why, isn't, why, aren't things, why aren't we seeing these incredible supernatural things that, that God's doing? We can, we can make what is descriptive here in how God works and, and, and make the assumption that this is how it should always be. But what is prescriptive here is that the Holy Spirit will come in power so that you will be my witnesses. But the second mistake that I make is that I assume that he never works like this. And, and so I place these limits on the Holy Spirit, and I, 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 I want him to operate in kind of my confines of, of what seems appropriate or healthy or normalized. There's nothing normal about what we're taking, what's going on here. In fact, some of the people looked at this in verse 13 and said, these guys must be drunk. 
which that's odd when you think about it, because I've never seen somebody who has too much alcohol and now can speak a second language. <laughs> like, I've seen people maybe who struggle with their first language, but you've never seen the opposite of that. So we can, we can have w- these different responses in, in our life, but you, I, let me go back to Acts chapter 4 for a moment. Because this is where I think I've experienced this in my own journey, my own walk with Jesus. These disciples are in front of this ruling council. This is an incredibly intimidating situation. And they just boldly proclaim Jesus. And, and the, the Sadducees look at them and they draw the conclusion. They say the, that they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. That they were astonished and recognized that they had been with Jesus. See, one, one of the ways, one of the ways that I have experienced the Holy Spirit's power to overcome obstacles is his ability to overcome the obstacle of me. So they, they look at these disciples and they think, who are these guys? They have no business being in front of us. They have no business being able to. These are common, uneducated guys. And the Holy Spirit is using them to launch this massive thing that he's going to call the church. That's going to change the world. See, where I've experienced the the Holy Spirit's power to overcome has been his ability to overcome my own limitations. My own sense of, of, I can't do this, or God is sending me into something greater than what I have the ability to do. Which, by the way, I think is one of the things, one of the places that we most readily experience the Holy Spirit's power in a place where we are in over our heads because we're dependent on him, because we need him. We we see two things in the New Testament as it relates to the Holy Spirit's power. One is prayer. The disciples just, they pray and they ask for it. God, give us your power. We see that throughout. And two, we see that in the face of impossible circumstances. So I think we, we discover, we experience his power to overcome when he puts us in places that we don't in and of ourselves have the ability to accomplish. He overcomes the obstacle of us. See, this is what we believe is is Chapel Street Church. We believe that God has, has put us here with the power of the Holy Spirit in order to witness for Jesus, to make Jesus known. We believe that as churches, but we believe that for all of you. We believe that God has put people in your life, in in your workplaces, on your sports teams, students, in your classrooms, so that you can witness for Jesus. And he will give you the power through his Holy Spirit for that exact purpose, to tell the story of Jesus, our firsthand encounters of Jesus. May we experience his power in us as the church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for this opportunity just to be here to worship you. And God, like the disciples some 2,000 years ago, we pray for your Spirit's power at work within us that we would boldly proclaim the name of Jesus, that we would tell the story of our firsthand encounters. Use us to make you known, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.